Did you know a charge off is the highest level of delinquency you can have besides a bankruptcy on your credit report? That's what makes it one of the hardest items to get removed from your credit report to date. But today I'm going to show you step by step the way that we can dispute charge offs to get them permanently deleted from our credit report. This will be the most accurate method that I can provide. And I'm going to give some information on exactly what you can expect, the fastest way that you could do this in the most accurate way possible. So join me on the computer. I'm going to show you step by step how to remove charge offs from your credit report. Let's get started. I want to preface this by saying um, when it comes to charge offs, there is no one that can guarantee you a charge off will be removed in a certain period of time. What I can promise you is that um, if we do it properly, it is possible that it can be done. All right. So. The another reason why I took my time with making this video was because I wanted to give you guys a little confirmation bias first. If you followed my previous videos, then you probably have seen your collections come off, your late payments come off, your hard inquiries come off, your personal information is corrected. And the reason why I started with that first is because I knew that was easier to get done. I could show my kids how to do that kind of stuff. It's a it's a very, very um, easy process um, once you understand how it works and once you know your rights. Now, when it comes to charge offs, they are a little bit more difficult. And the thing is, you can't really tailor one person's credit report to someone else's. And of course, every bank is different. So when I provide you with these steps, you got to understand it's not going to be like you follow each step verbatim, like everything's going to be exactly the same. Um, you have to kind of tailor it to your situation. So everything that I say just make sure that you take it with a grain of salt because charge offs and credit reports in this situation, they are not all the same. They're going to be different. So what works for one person may not work for you. Depends on your bank, depends on what's going on, depends on the situation of that charge off. They're not going to all be the same. So again, I just wanted to make sure I preface that in the beginning because this is going to be uh, a little bit more of a challenge, but I've done it myself and I've had eight charge offs. So if you only have one or two repossession, things like that, trust me, if I can get rid of eight, you can do it too. Getting rid of charge offs, in my opinion, it, it, it really just depends on how much the person wants it. So I just want to start off by saying that. So what is a charge off? A charge off means a company has written off a debt because it does not believe it will receive the money that it's owed. You are responsible for paying debt that is charged off. Paying off or settling the overdue debt does not mean it will be removed from the charge off status on the consumer's credit report. Instead, the status will likely be changed to charge off paid or charge off settled. And that's the reason why we focus on deleting the account. So you're still responsible for paying charge offs once the account is charged off. All right. There are situations where this might change and we are going to go through a few scenarios here. All right. There are scenarios where um, you may have a charged off account that becomes a collection. That's different. That's a that's a that's a situation of of double jeopardy where the account is uh, transferred but isn't updated properly. That that's another one of the easiest ways to get a charge off deleted. So today we're going to be talking about a few things. Factual disputes will be the main topic of conversation, but I will give you different scenarios because again, not everyone's charge offs will be the same. They're all going to be different. It depends on your situation. So there are different types of charge offs. There are high balance charge offs. A high balance charge off can be anything above fifteen hundred dollars. 
Those, depending on your situation, you may want to avoid disputing them. Sometimes they can be risky. The higher the balance, the more likely you are to be sued. Now, I want to make sure that when I give this information, I'm making sure to address everything as much as I possibly can. That, that's why I save charge offs for last. You can be sued even if you don't get an account re removed from your credit report. Keep that in mind. It's just that you're more likely to be sued when the account is over $1,500. That's a different video. Maybe in the future I'll talk about what happens, but a lawsuit isn't as big of a deal as you think. You go to court, there's ways to uh, deal with, with that. There's a lot of ways. Uh, but I just want to make sure that I do mention it. Um, low balance charge offs. That's anything below $1,500. You can usually get these deleted by factual disputes. They're a lot easier, you know. Paid accounts. Um, the account is paid or, or settled. Either you pay the full balance or you settle for a lower amount. Uh, whatever the case may be, this account is legally validated already. Technically, when you paid it off, you said that it was a legal valid account. So this is the account where you are going to do factual disputing. But if you're looking at this video and you looked at round one and round two for a paid account or settle balance, you can just jump to round three. You don't have to do round one and round two. The account's already validated, so you don't have to worry about that. A transferred account. Um, a transferred account usually has a zero balance and it should indicate sold or transferred, right? You need to check your credit report and you need to see if it's reporting as a zero balance and it indicates sold or transferred. A lot of charge offs can be deleted because, again, you'll see two accounts. Uh, one is a collection. Um, the other is being held by the actual uh, creditor, the original creditor. And some of us don't see that because we don't look at the right credit report. Usually in the past videos, excuse me, usually in the past videos, I've told you to go to um, Experian, Identity IQ. But for this one, I'm going to recommend that you stick with annualcreditreport.com. You can get your free reports every week still um, as of February 1st, 2024. And the reason why you need to go to annualcreditreport.com is because a lot of companies don't actually uh, put the entire report on their website. You want to look online and I'm going to give you specific examples of why you want to look um, online on annualcreditreport.com. I'm going to give you a few examples of why you want to make sure that you check that. All right. I am so sorry, guys. I'm not used to using a, <laughs> a slideshow, but this is like all the information I needed to make sure that I remember to address. So again, yeah, go to annualcreditreport.com. It has your real credit report with all the payment history and comments needed for factual disputes. So when we're doing factual disputes, we need as much information as possible. Information is ammunition. All right. If we want to make sure to get rid of these accounts, we need as much ammunition as possible. So we need to make sure that we get all the information that's on our reports and a few of the ones online that we use, like Identity IQ, um, Credit Karma, um, even Experian. That's the one I normally use. I would say it's the most accurate, but I could give specific examples of where it's missing information. That's why you want to go to annualcreditreport.com. If you do nothing else, make sure that you get the information from there if you do nothing else. All right. A little bit more information before I get into this. So after a company charges off an account, um, sometimes they sell that account to a debt buyer. And that's different from a collection agency. So debt buyers usually only buy charged off accounts because it's easier to sue you um, since they get information directly from the original creditor. And you usually will see like Midland funding, LVNB, portfolio recovery, things like that. And before I actually go any further, 
Again, I apologize. Transfer charge off accounts, we just talked about those. Non transferred just means that they're they're charged off accounts that are just the normal accounts that 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 you would see. And you can dispute those the same way you would dispute high balance or low balance. They just haven't been transferred yet. And we know about going to annual annualcreditreport.com. All right. The reason why I brought up 1099C form is because I figured a lot of people would have questions about this form because I've seen other people talk about it, but I don't think it's actually understood. So a 1099C form, if you have taxable debt of $600 or more that's been canceled by a lender, the lender is required to file a form 1099C with the IRS. The lender is also required to send you a copy of the 1099C cancellation of debt form so you can use it when you file your annual taxes. If the debt on your 1099C cancellation of debt form does not fall into one of the IRS's excluded categories, you might owe um, you might owe debt forgiveness tax. All right. To put it simply, a 1099C form is a cancellation of debt as long as the debt is more than $600. Usually you get this when a creditor actually discharges the debt. And probably some people are wondering like, okay, well, if I have a charge off, shouldn't I get a 1099C form in the mail? Let's address that. So 1099C requirements and mechanics. Generally, a creditor must file a form 1099C if one, the debt is in the amount of $600 or more, so it has to be that or more, and it has been discharged. I think that's a big part that most people don't get, which I had to understand. The A creditor can put on their books that your charge off is not going to be collected on or they believe that it's no longer an asset to them and they'll mark it as a charge off in their books. But that doesn't mean that they receive the corresponding tax credit for it. They can put your account in a charge off status and never write it off, which means they don't have to give you a 1099C. So to the creditor of an applicable entity, and three, an identifiable event has occurred. So a form 1099C must be filed in the year following the calendar uh, year in which the identifiable event had occurred. So January 31st to the debtor. That's the reason why I made this video after January 31st. On February 1st, which is today's date, you should have, um, if not received one, you should be receiving one soon. If the 1099C form was actually given out that means if the debt was actually discharged all right so january 31st to the debtor which would be you or me february 28th to the irs if paper filed and by march 31st to the irs if e-filed finally the only canceled or discharged debt that must be reported on a form 1099c is the principal amount of the debt owed however a creditor may report the interest and penalties forgiven if it so chooses. So uh, just to summarize that, they can actually charge the interest separately to you and say that you still owe the interest. But the principal amount they can then put on the 1099C, it's, it's at the creditor's discretion. So what if the creditor didn't send me a 1099C? A question I ask myself a lot, too. The creditor may take time to write off the debt officially. You may not receive the form for a few years. So again, and this is why I, I didn't hyper focus on 1099Cs, because the creditor may not have discharged the debt. They may have marked it as a charge off, but if they don't discharge it, write it off, right? The debt hasn't officially been written off per the IRS. So you may not get a 1099C for years. And you can also uh, ask a creditor to receive a 1099C. But even if you ask them to receive it, they may say something like, uh, we're not obligated to give you one or we haven't discharged this debt yet, which means they're still holding on to it. They 
haven't written it off yet. They haven't sold it. They're just holding on to it. But later down the line, a few years later, if they so choose to get a credit for it, a tax credit, you may get a 1099C years later. Um, my recommendation, since we're right on the, the, you know, we're at the beginning of February 1st, uh, you should start calling to see if you'll actually get one if you haven't received it yet. <clears throat> so... After the creditor writes off a debt, what is the deadline to file a 1099-C on my taxes? If a creditor writes off a debt and cancels or forgives the debt, they are required to send the debtor and the IRS a form 1099-C cancellation of debt by January 31st of the year following the tax year, of the year following that tax year, in which the debt was canceled or forgiven. For example, if a debt were canceled or forgiven in 2022, the creditor would need to send the debtor and the IRS to form 1099-C by January 31st, 2023. If the creditor fails to send form 1099-C or sends an incorrect form, the debtor should contact the creditor to request a corrected form. If the creditor does not respond, the debtor should contact the IRS to report the issue. It's important for debtors to report all, tech, all taxable canceled debt on their tax return in the year that the debt was canceled or forgiven. Failing to report canceled debt as taxable income can result in penalties and interest from the IRS. <clears throat> so again, the reason why I'm addressing this now is because a 1099C is not something that you're entitled to or that you can ask for um, and expect to receive. The only way that you get this form is if the creditor discharged the debt. And the only way that you'll know that is if you receive one or if you contact them and you ask for one. And the reason why you want to contact and ask for one is because once the debt is canceled or forgiven, we can get it deleted from your credit report. And I would say 1099Cs are probably one of the easier ways to get it done. You just can't always guarantee that you're going to get it, which is why it's not the thing that I rely on. But I'm going to talk about it just so that, you know, you're aware or in case it's asked, let's we might as well just address it. But it's not the thing that I would rely on when I removed all of my charge offs. I never got one charge off removed with a 1099C. I didn't, even though it's you definitely can. I, I didn't do it, but. Again, this is why it's like I, I waited to make this. There's so many different variables when it comes to charge offs. They're just they're all very different and it depends on your situation. All right. So what is the stature of limitations on a 1099C? Generally, there is no stature of limitation on a 1099C. Simply meaning you can get a 1099C this year. You could get it next year. You could get it in three years. They have up to seven years to provide you with that. After seven years, then they can't report the account generally, you know, for your state. It, it depends on your state. But after seven years, for the most part, it's a wrap. The account's deleted. But any time within that time frame, the creditor decides to discharge that debt, they'll send you one. So... The creditor does not have to send you the form promptly so that you can include it on your tax return. I'm sorry, but the creditor does have to send you the form promptly so that you can include it on your tax returns. There is no rule about how long a creditor has to officially charge off your debt. So it could be years before you receive the form in the mail. There are exclusions to being sent a 1099C like bankruptcy or if you settle the debt. So if you settle the debt and you pay it, they don't need to send you a 10, a 10 99 C. If you file for bankruptcy, they don't need to send it. That debt has been discharged um, because you file for bankruptcy. There's no need to cancel the debt if you file for bankruptcy or if you settle that debt. This is only for um, and they actually can send it uh, still if you settled it. But this is generally for. um when they have discharged or written off that debt. Okay, I wanted to get the 1099C stuff out the way 
because I figured out I have questions about it. But now we're going to get to the real reason why you came here. We're going to get to how to dispute a charge off. So I broke it down into four parts. Step one, we're going to send an investigation complaint. You never send a factual dispute to initially dispute a charge off. Step two, we're going to send an, a reinvestigation follow-up complaint. Step three, we're going to use factual disputes. I like to use date of last activity. Usually that's one of the first attributes I would attempt. And in step four, payment history or any other factual dispute that uh, we can find. So really quick, let me just exit the slideshow for one second because I want to pull up here. You guys know I always use um, the Cornell Law School uh, 15 U.S. Code 1681 procedure. I know you want this done fast. I know you guys want this done as soon as possible. But there are steps that we need to take because a charge off account is much harder to get off than a collection. Much harder, but it can be done if you follow a procedure. So the reason why we first have to send a procedural investigation, our right as a consumer, we can ask the credit bureaus to dispute anything for any reason, just because we feel like it, just because I want a dispute doesn't have to have a reason. I just want one. I'm entitled to, to one. That's my right. Okay. We need to have them do that. And we need to ask them, Hey, credit bureaus, I'm looking at my account. This account doesn't look right. We don't ever talk about what's wrong. We just say it doesn't look right. Don't give them anything. Just say it doesn't look right. Unless again, it's a paid account. If it's paid, then you can go right to um, the factual dispute. But if it's not paid or settled, we're going to look at that and we're going to say, hey, something's wrong. I'm going to give you a template about what to say, but what's wrong? I need to figure it out. Can you investigate? Reinvestigation comes next. We ask them to reinvestigate. I looked at it again. I disagree. This doesn't look right. Can you look at it again? We need them to verify twice and say two times. We looked at it and it looks good. And this is why we need it right here. We're going to scroll down. Right here to section five. Treatment of inaccurate or unverifiable information. So if after any reinvestigation, if after any reinvestigation, under paragraph one of any information disputed by a consumer, an item of the information is found to be inaccurate or incomplete or cannot be verified. The consumer reporting agency shall promptly delete that item of information from the file of the consumer or modify that item of information as appropriate based on the results of the reinvestigation and promptly notify the furnisher that the information has been modified or deleted from the file of the consumer. So see, right here is the reason why we need to do those first two steps initially. We need to get them to confirm that they verified that that account was accurate. They did it twice. I asked you for a procedural investigation. I asked you to reinvestigate. Now I can go right into my factual, di my disputes, knowing that you told me everything was accurate. So I just want to I like to know why sometimes things have to be the way that they have to uh, be so that it makes sense. All right. So that's why we have to do step one and step two first. And then we go in, into step three and step four. Now, round one dispute. This is step one. Remember, I said we're going to send an investigation complaint. And when we send it, we send it through the CFPB. At the very end, I'm going to go through that process. If not, I could probably put a link to a video um, that I have where I showed you guys how to file a CFPB complaint. If not, I'm going to do it in this video again for anybody new. So round one dispute, step one, we send an investigation complaint through the CFPB. You can also send letters if you want. Um, you just add your first name, last name, your social, your address, and then you can look up the address for the corresponding credit bureau. 
Um, I personally have found that it was no different between me sending letters and me just going through the CFPB. And personally, for me, I noticed there was no different. If you want to send a letter, by all means, you can do both. I don't think that either one would, would be a problem. So, again, step one, we never send factual disputes until after you've asked for a procedural reinvestigation unless it's already paid or settled. At that point, you already admitted that the account was yours and it's verified. So this is an example of what you can say. Recently, I looked at a copy of my credit report and noticed several inaccuracies on my account. This account is hurting my ability to obtain credit. It is my understanding that you will investigate these items for me to ensure accuracy. Here is the item I am asking you to verify as accurate. You then put the account name and the number that's shown on the report. This is the first complaint round. Again, <laughs> we don't put a reason. This is very general. It's very broad. We're just asking them, hey, I looked at it. I noticed several inaccuracies. What do you think? That's it. We're just, we're basically getting in position. You got to understand that the credit bureaus, they have laws to protect them with, um, with um, handling their disputes. We have laws for us. We just need to basically get them in position where we can get these accounts deleted quickly. So um, you guys can copy this. Uh, if you want to, you can copy it verbatim. I would try to, you know, we have to change it up a little bit to put your account name and your information, but just something general. It, it shouldn't be very long. You don't have to put laws in there. Just make it very, very general. All right. This is going to be round two, step two. We're going to ask them for a reinvestigation. So we're going to say something along the lines of, I'm in disagreement with the account listed below, which still appears on my credit report. Even after your investigation, I would like this item to be immediately reinvestigated. The inaccuracies are highly injurious to my credit score. Sorry about that, guys. All right. And then you're going to put the, uh, the name of the account, um, the account number shown on the report, and then here I have a little tidbit just so that they're aware that we do know our laws. In accordance with the Fair Credit Reporting Act, Law 91506, and then the title, the section, the subsection, please provide the names and business addresses of each individual with whom you verified um, above so that I may follow up. Please send an updated copy of my credit report after your reinvestigation. Now, some of you may actually notice that the accounts are starting to get deleted after uh, step two. You usually step one, nothing happens. Step two, we're not giving them any specific details yet. We're not talking about any factual disputes. Now we're just asking, hey, can you tell me who you verified this with? Can you give me the names of the individuals? Can you please make sure that um, you update a copy of my credit report after your reinvestigation. So now you may notice some things come off. You may not. If you do good, if you don't, then we proceed to the, to the next step. But this is really just getting them in position to basically say, oh, we verified it. This account was good. Okay. And you verified it. Awesome. Now, before I show you round three, I got to go over the most common charge off inaccuracies. So one of the easiest ways to get stuff removed from your credit report is repeatedly reporting charge off every month. And I'm going to give you guys an example. Every time your account updates, like if you look at it and it shows like where it shows the payment history, it shows charge off, charge off, charge off, charge off. It's it's updating the stature of limitations. It's extending it. Every update to that account makes the account look newer than it is. And reaging the account is illegal. They can't do that. I'm going to give you examples, but I just want to go over. These are the most common reasons you're going to get a charge off deleted 
and pretty much you're going to plug one of these reasons in after you look at your report and you're going to put that in a round three. So not indicating when or if the account has been sold misrepresentation of the account status. You're going to look at your account and you may have a car with capital one. That account may have been sold to portfolio recovery. But when you look at your credit report, it's going to show capital one with a balance and then it's going to show a collection with that same balance but it's not going to show on the capital one credit card charge off that that account had actually been um had actually been sold it needs to have that status on there and this is why i'm telling you you need to go to annualcreditreport.com and look at your report you probably won't see this on credit karma you probably won't see this on um, Identity IQ. You might see it on Experian, but I can tell you for TransUnion, you never get that information, even with Experian. So you wanna make sure that you go to annualcreditreport.com and you wanna get your report there because you'll be able to see all these inaccuracies. Um, not reflecting a zero balance after transferred, uh, sold, or paid, that's double jeopardy. So, if they transferred this Capital One account to recovery portfolio collection, that Capital One account should have a zero balance. If it doesn't, that's inaccurate. I can't have a balance on both of these accounts. Two, two different, um, the creditor and the collection agency can't both be trying to collect on this one account. You can't do that. That's in inaccuracy that can get a charge off deleted it's actually one of the easiest ones reporting inconsistent balances across across credit bureaus i'm gonna actually pull up identity iq because as if you are familiar with the website identity iq shows you all the balances and all the information from each credit bureau it's not going to be as in-depth as annualcreditreport.com but it'll be good as an example all right um, date of first delinquency. Hmm, that can illegally be changed. I've seen that a lot. It should reflect the month and year it was first delinquent. And then changes after 180 days charged off status. We, we can't have any changes. Once a charge off goes past 180 days, the account is dead. It's done. You can't have on-time payments. You can't add anything else to it. There should be nothing left on there. You can't do that. That's illegal. That's an inaccuracy. So I'm going to start showing you examples of what to look for so that when you go to annualcreditreport.com, I could promise, I won't make it guarantees, but I feel like I could almost guarantee that one of these you're going to find most definitely on a charge off. All right, so here's a factual dispute about repeated charge off. Remember what I said? Remember what I said about the account showing charge off, charge off, charge off, charge off, charge off multiple times? Look at this. This account, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to zoom in and it's going to the next page. I'm sorry about that, guys. This account says charge off, charge off, charge off, charge off. So this account was initially charged off, looks like February of 2022, 180 days past due. But yet, it's being reported every single month. They're updating this account. So look, let's, let's go back. Repeatedly reporting charge off every month. Wow, there we go. Is that not what's going on here? That's inaccurate. They can't do that. That is an inaccuracy. And this is a, a screenshot pulled from annualcreditreport.com, which is why I'm telling you guys you want to pull from, from, from there. I'm going to pull the same account up on Identity IQ, and I'm going to make a comparison because I, I want to show you exactly what I'm talking about. So I was able to pull this same account up on Identity IQ. So check this out, guys. Check this out. Remember, we just talked about that every month after February 2022, 
that this account was charge off, charge off, charge off, charge off, charge off. Look, look at this. On Identity IQ, it says, okay, 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 okay. That's not what we just saw, right? So if we go here, this is the exact same account with Merrick Bank. Look at this. After February, charge off, charge off, charge off, charge off, charge off, charge off, charge off. Right? On Identity IQ, it just says that the account is okay. See, we wouldn't get that information if we didn't get the annualcreditreport.com uh, that that report identity IQ didn't show that which is why I keep stressing make sure you get the report from annualcreditreport.com all right let's look for other inaccuracies let's let's look um look at this one the balance on TransUnion for this Mary Bank account is zero look, look at that the balance on Equifax is $914 wasn't that one of our? Yeah, look, there we go. Um, reporting inconsistent balances across bureaus right there. There it is. It's reporting inconsistent balances across bureaus. That would be another one of uh, another one of um, our reasons that we can say that the account is inaccurate. OK. What else can we come up with? Oh, Date of last activity. So check this out. This account shows that September 1st, 2021 was the date of last activity. Well, let's double check that. The day of last activity would basically be the date that the account first went into a delinquent status. So it would be the first day that we got a 30 day past due notice. So September 21st, we already see here, it says June 22nd, 2021. That's an inaccuracy right there. The day of last activity cannot be June 22nd, 2021. Or, I mean, it can't be both that and September. So let's go back and let's take a look. Look at this, guys. Two inaccuracies. It shows right here that August 2021 was paid on time. There isn't even a 30 day pass due. It's paid on time. How did it go right into 60 days in September? It was paid on time. That's an inaccuracy. And the, the first day of delinquency would technically not be. Um, well, it, it wouldn't be September. It would have to be August. So even when we're looking at this, this should be August. This should be August. These are both wrong. So date of last activity is wrong. The balance is completely wrong. Um, the repeated char charge offs are completely wrong. We already have three different reasons that we can dispute. Let let's see if we have any more. Date of first delinquency, we have that. Reporting inconsistent balances, we have that. Uh, and then repeat it. So we already have three different things that we can dispute, right? All right. So you would pull up your credit report from annualcreditreport.com. You would look at your charged off account and you would look at one of these common reasons. Of course, after you ask them to investigate, reinvestigate, they tell you it's all good. And then we hit them with this one right here. So I'm going to give you an example of what to say for uh, repeated charge off because you'll probably see this one a lot. All right. So this is the round three, um, disputing factual information. So this account was charged off on the following date. So remember the charge off date that we had, it was September, 2021, right? Since then, the account has repeatedly been updated as charged off every month. This is an update in the payment history. A charged off account should not include an active payment history. This inaccurate information falsely manipulates the stature of limitations. You failed to investigate this account properly and your neglect has violated my rights. I am demanding a deletion of the following account. And then you will put your account name, your account number. You would want to send a copy of your driver's license. I always send the copy of my social security card and proof of address. I recommend that you do the same. So factual disputes, if you saw this example, 
the dispute should be no longer than three sentences. Just identify what the account is, explain what's wrong and the desired outcome. So, I mean, that's that's simply what we're going to do. We're, we're, we're just going to identify the account, explain what what's wrong and what we want. Because you have to understand, we already asked them twice to do their job. Now we use the law. Look, I asked you twice to do something. I followed the, the process of reinvestigation. You didn't do it. And now that you didn't do it, I'm going to tell you what's wrong. Now, keep in mind, the credit bureaus have the option of either doing one, updating the account. Or two, they can delete it. So they do have the option to update. So here's the thing. What happens when we get to round four and they decide that they just want to update the account? We pick a different reason. So for this example, I just showed um, if there was a double jeopardy, right? So if there were two accounts that, because this is the probably the next most common reason, I don't have an example of it to show you, but let's say that this account with Merrick Bank had a charge off with a zero balance for TransUnion and for Equifax, but now I have a collection account of the same amount, I would send this. So the following accounts are claiming to both own the same debt with a balance. As you know, this is not possible and also a violation of my rights. Because of this, both accounts need to be removed from my credit re re report immediately due to not properly validating the information in which a company has passed to you. Please delete immediately. When the requested above deletions are made, please mail me an updated copy of my credit report. You list account one and you list account two. So in my experience, going back to, um, I'm sorry, our most common charge off inaccuracies, it's usually going to be one of these. And again, the credit bureaus don't necessarily have to delete it. They can update it. But what happens is when you start with one inaccuracy and then you mention another inaccuracy and then you mention another inaccuracy, you may get to like round five. And by then they're going to delete it because you have to keep reminding them that they're neglecting to do their their job and you can point it out. You have to stay on top of it. Um, before I show you how to submit this with the CFPB, a couple other things I want to actually go over. Uh, first thing, you don't have to wait 30 days in order to respond back to the credit bureaus. Here's the problem. If you wait 30 days and they already responded to you, it's going to start this process over again and you'll have to start with round one. So I'm going to tell you what I do. And this is something where, again, like it isn't like a a process where um, it's not a process where it's like clean cut. It's different for everybody. Right. But what I do is I get alerts from I have the Experian app on my phone. I have uh, Credit Karma on my phone for TransUnion to get updates with that. And then I also have an Equifax account. Credit Karma is free. The Equifax account is free. TransUnion is free unless you want all three credit bureaus. If you sign up for TransUnion, whenever you have a dispute, they'll tell you when they responded and when that dispute gets closed. When you are disputing with the CFPB, they won't tell you. The CFPB complaint can be open for 60 days. So they'll take their time to close it so that you have to start from round one. So here's I'm going to give you an example. If I were disputing this account with Merrick Bank right now, in about probably a week or 10 days, um, TransUnion Equifax will come back and say, oh, it's verified. You know how I, I know? I get an alert on Credit Karma for TransUnion, or I can go to Equifax.com and I can see there that they're going to close the dispute. Just sign up for an account. If you want, I have another link where you can sign up to get your uh, free FICO 8 scores. If you follow that video, it, it shows you the exact same um, steps of how to create the account so that you have it and they're free. I get an alert within, you know, five, six, seven days showing the, the complaint is closed. It won't show it on the CFPB, but it'll show it there. 
So if in 10 days, let's say that was round one and they say, yo, it's verified, Steven. We made sure it, it's all good. I go right to the CFPB and what do I do? I go right to round two and I say, uh, I'm in disagreement. They say, OK, you see a new dispute start. You can go into the Equifax website. You'll see the dispute. You can go into Experian. Experian will literally send you an alert when that new dispute is is active again. And then when it's closed and then uh, you could do the same thing with Credit Karma for trans for uh, TransUnion. Um, and they'll actually show you an update and update you when a dispute has been closed. But you have to keep up with that. You you have to. And I think TransUnion is the hardest one. They're the hardest one. They make it hard on purpose. Like they purposely make it very hard to tell if a um, if a dispute has been closed or not. So you got to stay on top of it. So. You can actually get through. Four rounds within a month within a month and a half, realistically. Round one, re, uh, investigation. Round two, reinvestigation. Round three, here's my actual um, facts that I'm disputing with. Let's say that they come back and they say, oh, we updated the, the account. It's either going to be updated or deleted at that point. They, they can verify it, but I mean, if it's actual information where it's not accurate, they'll probably either update it or delete it. Then you come back with your second one or your second reason. This is like round four, right? You can do this like every time they respond. You have to pay attention to it, but you can do it every time they respond. It's easy. You just keep doing it until you get like a probably like around some of some of this stuff will come off on round two. Some will come off around three, four, uh, five. And then you just keep going with all of your reasons. And that's why um, you can't just say that the account is fraud. Why? Because charge offs are always with the original creditor. They have all the information. They can verify it. They have it. So you can't just say that simply. That's not going to work. It may work some, sometimes, but it doesn't always work. You can't just say that. You can't say that this account isn't mine. They can verify it, which is why for charge offs, we have to go through this lengthy process. Now, in my opinion, doing it through the CFPB, making sure that you respond and not letting them wait you out to have to restart the process, you know, re respond within 15 days, you're going to see results a lot faster. And this is the method that I actually um, acquired from different people, uh, from my own findings that I've had the most success with. Now, it didn't all happen at one time because a lot of the time I spent learning this stuff. But for you, I'm giving you all the information up front. So now, again, this is one example, but your account could look totally different. And I didn't hit every single reason why, but you're going to have to interpret that reason for yourself. If you have an account and you notice, oh, that's double jeopardy. Oh, that's repeated. Oh, that's something. If you just show them two different credit bureaus, Equifax and TransUnion, and there's inconsistencies between those two, you can have them look at two, re two reports and you can say, hey, if this report is coming from the same data furnisher as this report and they're not exactly the same, they're inaccurate. So that's why I'm like, um, you know, you have to interpret it. You have to go actively look out and find out what's wrong. There is no general one, one letter, one thing that can just solve this issue. Okay. Again, I, that's the reason why I took so long to make this, this video, because it's not a one size fits all like the rest of them. It's literally tailor made to you and your profile. Um, the next thing I'm going to show you before we before we end this video i, I want to show you how to process this or how i do it through the cfpb website all right so you're going to go to cfpb um and you can google this or uh consumerfinance.gov and as you guys know if you don't have an account you have to create one but we're going to start by going to submit a complaint click on that scroll down and start new complaint All right, so if you don't have an account, sign up for an account, verify your email. Okay, once you're logged in, you're gonna go to start new complaint. We're gonna click on that. We're, we're gonna go to improper use of credit report and reporting company used your credit report improperly. 
And have you already tried to fix this problem with the company? Always yes. Did you request information from the company? Yes. Uh, did the company provide this information? No. And we're going to go next. So what happened? Um, again, guys, from the letter uh, or from the example that I gave you, we could enter round one information. We could enter round two information. Um, let's go and let me do one of the round threes. Let's do the charge off account. All right, cool. So you're going to go here and you're going to put in your information. This account was charged off on the following date. Um, since then, I have been re repeatedly, you know, exactly what we went over. So you're going to put what happened what account it involves, uh, the inaccuracy, and what you want done. And then um, you're just going to put the same information here, but here you can add, I am demanding a deletion of the following account, account name, account number, same information here. You could just copy this part because that's the outcome that you're looking for. And then you attach your documents. Re remember I said you would attach your ID, your driver's license. Um, I would attach your social security card. Um, I would attach a proof of residence, so like a utility bill or something of that nature, and then um, a screenshot of the inaccuracy. And if you requested a report from annualcreditreport.com and they mailed you one, because again, sometimes TransUnion does this where they won't allow you to get the report, you can have it mailed to you, and then you can take a, a picture of it and then add that here showing what the problem is. And this is going to be like, this is for a factual dispute, what I'm showing you now. But prior to this, you'll do a round one, you'll do a round two. And then you're going to enter the company's name. We're looking at Experian. And you could do Experian Credit Reporting Agency. You're going to enter all this information, just like we have done before. You're going to enter your date of birth, your name as it appears on your credit report, however that appears, whether it's first name, middle name, last name, or uh, first name and last name. Uh, did you want to complain about another company? If you want, you can actually just go ahead and just throw that on here. You can add TransUnion. Now, remember, you only want to complain about the company, about the company um, that actually has the account. So if the account doesn't report to Experian, but it reports to TransUnion and, and Equifax, just do TransUnion and Equifax. If the company um, just reports one credit bureau, just do one. Yes, I already tried to fix the problem. Did you request information? Yes. Did the company provide the information? No. And then you're going to enter again. This is all the same information. If you've watched any prior videos, we've done this step before. But anybody new, we're going to do this for you guys because you may not know. And then do you want to complain about another company? Yes, I want to complain about. I did Experian, TransUnion. I want to complain about Equifax. Let's see. Equifax Information Services. All right, have you already tried to fix the problem? Yes, we have. Did you request information from the, the uh, company? Yes, I did. Did, you, uh, did the company provide the information? No, they did not. And then same thing, so on and so forth. So when you're done, you should have all the credit bureaus here that you are trying to dispute that charge off with. Then we're going to hit next and go to the next page. You're always going to click myself. Um, there are actually, I never mentioned this, but there are actually laws out there that when you have someone else file a complaint or dispute on your behalf, the credit bureaus have the right to throw that out as frivolous. So that's one of the stall tactics that they use. So whenever you're doing this, you always fill it out as myself. And just so you know, um, 
when you're disputing these things, the reason why we we always do one reason at a time and we don't list them all at one time is because you can only dispute and account for the same reason one time. So if you go, oh, charge off repeatedly, and let's say now the credit bureaus update the information so it's accurate, and then you go, oh, yeah, but my date of last status is not right, and they update that information, you can't go back and then try to use the same one again, even if they didn't update it. It's going to be seen as frivolous. So you'll want to use one at a time until eventually they delete it. And from my experience, eventually they do. You have to be patient. You have to be diligent. And again, when you file the CFPB report, the CFPB report will not update as fast as the credit bureaus respond. They will let the uh, they'll let the complaint stay open, even though it's already been completed. So you're going to have to make sure to check uh, with Experian, get the get the notifications. They'll they'll tell you once they're done disputing with Equifax. They'll tell you when they're done. They always do. And then with TransUnion, which is, I think, the hardest one, TransUnion won't always say when they're done. You have to just kind of check up on them. Credit Karma can sometimes be good for that because what will happen is the account will update and it'll say like um, like uh, consumer dispute re like resolved. Sometimes they don't even update that, which is a violation, but um, it's a very, it's like very low on the totem pole. It doesn't always work if you dispute that reason, like they didn't update the comment and said that, that this account is no longer in dispute. It happens though, but you'll want to make sure to watch that because again, if they respond within seven days, in seven days, you could send the next round the same day. And the, so this doesn't have to take you four or five months. This could take you four or five weeks, less than that. It just depends on how fast they, they respond. So just bear that in mind. So who are you submitting this complaint for? You always choose myself. Now, once I click this, it's going to show some personal information. So like always, I'm going to click it and then I'm going to cut to the next step. All right. So once you get all the way down to the bottom, you're just going to hit the review option in step five. So we're going to click on review. And then once you hit the review option, you're going to re you're going to review the complaint, make sure all the information is good. You haven't missed anything. And I'm just going to scroll to the bottom here. All right. So I cut to the bottom. You're going to hit the I authorized um, and the information given is true. And then you're going to submit the complaint. Now, I won't submit this complaint because um, this is just an example. But, yeah, those are the steps that I took to remove all charge offs from my account um for this video guys if it seemed convoluted if it wasn't really comprehensive i apologize i'm so sorry um i tried to organize it the best i can because when it comes to charge offs it's just it's so much information that there is and in order to get rid of it, it it's not really like a it's not really like one thing that you could do like all the other videos that I've made. Um, if so for this one, again, if it's very convoluted, I'm sorry. Uh, I recommend just going back and rewinding it if you want to take notes and then maybe Google some of the stuff that I was saying um, just to maybe get a clear depiction of what I was trying to get at. Watch some other videos uh, in conjunction with this video and then, you know, come to your uh, own conclusion to see what it is that you could do. These are all just strategies and these are methods and we're just sharing information. If you have more information, put it in the comments. You know, uh, if you've if you've done some of this and it has worked for you, please, I would love to put that in the comments. If you want any other videos in regards to credit, please put it in the comments, too, and let me know. I'm, I'm getting... Um, I'm getting to the end of credit repair. I may have like maybe four other videos in me left in regards to repairing credit. And then I'm going to be moving on to something else uh, for this channel. Uh, credit repair, I feel like, is the foundation of a lot of the things that I'm going to discuss. But it isn't the 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 only thing that I'm going to have on this channel. I'm, 
going to probably show you how to make money online. I do a lot of stuff to make money online. Uh, currently, I'm self-employed. I make money on my own. So I could show you how to do that. Um, I want to talk about investing uh, stocks, things of that nature. So, you know, we're, we're going to be moving on here, but I do know that before you do anything, one of the 